I just want to say we are so honored and thrilled to be here uh, and, and thankful uh, to the Lemmy Nation for so much uh, for having us here today. Thank you for the invitation, Emma and Rita, and, and for welcoming us to your territory and, uh, and for taking on the Tokitai Return Project. That's not the name of it. I don't know what we're calling it exactly. The, the, the Journey Home, Tokitai's Journey Home is a good one. Uh, it, is, it is so, so important to us. And what I want to do is, is try to clarify what we've been doing for 20-some uh, years to, to try to make that happen in our particular way, uh, which is first and foremost to try to tell her story. But we just can't do it in the, the depth and the substance and the, the, the traditional way that the Lummies can tell the story. Uh, when, when the council passed that unanimous resolution to, to, to resolve, to bring her home somehow, some way, some day, uh, it, it just it took you know, our lives in, in this whole campaign to a whole new level and we are so grateful we are in complete harmony with the entire message. We've been trying to emphasize the Salish Sea, the need to, to restore habitat and ecosystem uh, all these years. Uh, but we only have a couple of decades of, of history uh, doing that compared to 10,000 years. So uh, it's a very powerful voice and we're so thankful that the Lemmys are, are taking it on. Um, but beyond just telling her story, which is an end in itself, is a reward and a benefit uh, mm -hmm. all these years. So it's, you know, it's, it's always been a win just to be able to tell her story, which means to tell her family story her background story, because that's essential to understanding her and how it works, how she can come home. Uh, but basically, to sort of break it down, we've been trying to make two essential cases uh, to convince the public, the owners of the sequarium, the courts, the agencies, the media, everybody that she needs to come home. And the first is that she just deserves it. If you have an ounce of empathy, you can see that she is confined. She is in solitary confinement. That can't be right. I don't know how she survives. I have gained a huge amount of respect for her over these years. When we started this campaign, she was already there 25 years, and we thought it's probably the end of the line. All the others had already died. We thought we didn't have much time. We better make this case and, and win right away. But it's been almost another 25 years. And yet, I was there with the, the Tokitai team uh, March 14th when we went in to see her, um, and I was, I was blown away by her energy, her vim and vigor, her responsiveness, her ability to just pick up and move, to, to swim laps, to, to do her show involves, that she does twice a day, right at the top, two big breaches. And during the show, besides these power splashes to hit the front eight rows with tidal waves, uh, she's doing all kinds of barrel rolls and, and speed laps and, and two more breaches during the show. She's got the energy and she's got all her teeth. We can't all say that. Uh, she, she's in what by every you know, external appearance not having recent access, although we, we did, due to the court cases, get quite a bit of access to the veterinary records. Um, she has some stress-related uh, infections, ulcers, but nothing, nothing debilitating, nothing terminal, 
nothing that uh, can't be controlled, and nothing that won't clear up when she's home. And that's in the veterinary literature, that return to native habitat is the most therapeutic treatment for all those stress-related problems. But the second part of our challenge, and, and we've won the first part. I mean, I, I really, see, I need notes. <laughs> because I really want to make that point that over the 25 years, we and a, and a huge army of people that have been out there and with the catalyst of the film Blackfish about five or six years ago that really took it over the top, I think we have won in the court of public opinion that yes, yeah, she should come home, that it's terrible that she's there. It's a travesty, it's a tragedy, terrible thing, and it needs to be corrected. And that has had a huge effect just from uh, Thursday's uh, San Diego Union Tribune, that's where one of the uh, SeaWorld parks is located. Uh, the article was that attendance dropped another 13% at this year from in 2017. Uh, that's after four years of continued declines in attendance. Um, and uh, you know, that's just a good indication. But it also mentioned in this article that Madrid-based Parcos Reunidos, which owns this aquarium based in Spain, has also posted a 1% decline in visitation. Now, they own a whole lot of you know, water parks for kids, slides and stuff, but they also own this aquarium, and so Lolita, Tokitai, but also a park in uh, France that has four orcas that is in very serious public relations trouble. So they're losing attendance because they're holding orcas captive. The rest of the theme park industry is doing fine. They're, they're posting big increases. So public opinion really has come around big time. They're seeing that the display for entertainment of captive whales and dolphins is really a continuation of the 2,000 year old Roman circus, you know, the Colosseums where large mammals were captured all over northern Africa and brought into these Colosseums to be slaughtered for entertainment. It was family fun, that's how they, were, they would bill it then, and that's how this, the marine parks have now. So we've really won in the court of public opinion, but we haven't accomplished our second big challenge, and that is to show the world that it can be done safely, that she'll be fine, that she'll not only survive the trip, but she'll thrive, that it will bring her back to robust good health. Most of the world has been convinced in the marine park industry, SeaWorld, Seaquarium, the rest of them, have had the stage all to themselves for 50 years. And they have successfully co-opted the scientific community. They have sponsored the marine mammal science conferences. They've hosted, they've given the scholarships they, and the positions. They are big time uh, embedded in the scientific community. They have effectively gagged the scientific community and convinced them that they being the authorities, because they have the day-to-day -day contact with the whales and dolphins, that they know better than us by far, and that they know, and this is in the media every time they're interviewed in every statement they make, that she'll die. Bring her home and she'll die. They don't say how, they don't say when, they don't say what part of that journey is gonna have that big of an effect on her, but they've got the world convinced. And it makes it very, very difficult to find endorsements from the scientific community and from authorities, uh, just some very courageous and, and good critical thinkers who are able to see through that, um, and most especially the Lummi Nation now are able to, to see through that, that public relations uh, sheen of the, the, the marine park industry over all those years. 
so uh, the, main, the main issue that they bring up, when you pin them down, for most of the public, they don't have to because they're the authorities, but if you actually try to get to what it is they're talking about, they're talking about pathogens, disease. They're saying that, well, she is now uh, in a weakened state and uh, she carries Atlantic Ocean pathogens and so she will maybe infect her family and that could be, you know, horrible. I mean, that prospect is really frightening. If that were true, we wouldn't, we wouldn't go near this whole project. But it's not. It's not. And our test case was Keiko the free willy whale. We were very deeply involved in that from the very beginning. We followed every bit of it. And uh, there were the same you know, objections from the industry and from Iceland. They swore he's never coming back to, that was you know, his home where he was captured. Then after 20 some years in captivity, they, you know, the, the hue and cry was, well, he'll infect the Icelandic orcas. So, to deal with that, the, uh, the project, the Free Willy Keiko Foundation, asked the USDA to appoint a panel of six pathologists and veterinarians to come out and examine him uh, thoroughly. And their findings were there is no current indication that Keiko is ill. He showed no clinical pathological evidence of chronic deep-seated infection during his residence in Oregon. Immunological tests are apparently within known parameters and there was no evidence of recent viral challenges to 48 different viruses, every one they could find to test for. So then the Icelandic vets came out and, and reviewed all that and examined him again and they confirmed. He's okay. He's not a risk. And we would insist on the exact same procedure for Tokitai, that she would have to be examined. And we would want that assurance as much as anyone else. But there's no reason to think and no reason to scare the public, and that's what it is, it's a scare tactic, that she would infect her family, cause any such problems. And so people say, oh, the transport. Yeah, but you know, you can't just fly a whale, a 6,000 pound whale in a plane. Well, you can because it's been done like a hundred times. How did they get there in the first place? It's routine. There's a protocol for it. Um, and, and we've spelled it all out in our plan that is online. It's been there, it's being refined for over 20 years. It's, it's, it's a very good plan. Um, but, you know, the conclusion is there is no significant risk to her or to her family. You just can't accept that premise. You know, I mean, sure, it might be okay to think, well, if there is a risk, it's still better. But why even accept the premise that there is such a risk? Because there's no scientific or precedent reason to think that, that there would be. In contrast, staying in captivity is a very serious risk. Remember, she is the only survivor. All the other 40 plus or so, the records are not perfect, so we have to sort of estimate, but that were captured from southern residents, and there were northern residents and transients also captured, and they had all died by 1987, and yet she's still alive. Here it is, 27, 2018. Uh, she has some kind of character, some kind of patience. When the, the veterinarian who was sent out to pick a whale from among the ones captured at Penn Cove found her, somehow he knew. He was a, a very perceptive person. And he knew, and he said right at the time, he said, she is so courageous and yet so gentle. And that was before she'd even left the Salish Sea. He knew that. He went into a, apparently, according to his daughter, he's passed, but that he went into a curio shop at Pike Place Market where those sea pens were, and he must have seen the name Tokitai on a, some native art. 
and heard that it meant nice day, pretty colors, as a Chinook, sort of a universal greeting uh, for trading on the trail. So he uh, gave her that name. Of course, when, he, when she got to Miami right away, they said, no, that's, a, that's not a good stage name. That's not something we can advertise. Let's call her Lolita. And that's what they call her to the public. But still to this day, because that veterinarian gave her that name, the early training staff and still all the trainers, and there's been many you know, generations of trainers now over 47 years, they all call her Toki. That's what she responds to. That's what she hears as her name. So we call her Toki. Um, so let's see, proceeding here. I want to continue with Keiko a little bit because it's an amazing story that is in sharp contrast to everything the media believes and the public believes and the scientific community believes until you really look into the facts. And I want to tell you about the, those first moments when he was lowered after the air transport from Newport, Oregon to Iceland, which is 10, 11, 12 hours. Uh, they refueled in the air, fortunately. but. September 9th, 1998, he arrived. Thousands of Keiko's fans and 546 journalists. That's just an indication of what will come with Toki when she returns. It's going to be a very big stage. We're going to be able to give our message to the world right away. Um, so 546 journalists. This is from the Free Willy Keiko Foundation. Uh, uh, as soon as he is immersed, lowered in the stretcher, he pumps his flukes to swim clear of the stretcher and immediately dives. He surfaces a full minute later, circling the enclosure, energetically exploring his new home as he turns to his human friends perched at the pool's edge. He allows the trainer to scratch him briefly, but seems more interested in the place than in the humans. Within two and a half hours, Keiko communicates with a pilot whale that swims into the cove. He's visible to tourists from far away by telescope. So he's just alone in his home, in his backyard again for the first time. And in his case, it was about 25 years. The uh, executive director of the foundation says he's vocalizing night like never before. And he came alive pretty well. He was near death in Mexico City. They rescued him just in time, got him into a $12 million, I believe unnecessary tank, but it had natural seawater. That was a different, and a whole lot more room and depth. And so he, he really, he, he came alive visibly there but even far more so when he came into the water in Iceland. So three days later, his activity level is much higher than it was in Oregon. He begins porpoising, that's speed swimming, coming out of the water immediately in graceful arcs. And in the past, he had often you know, stayed at the surface because that's where he was fed was at the surface, so he would sort of hang at the surface. Not anymore. He was underwater. His dive times increased up to 17 minutes. Hold your breath for 17 minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> Try. His uh, veterinarian, Dr. Cornell, is visibly moved. He says, as a veterinarian, Keiko's medical survivor and a human being, he says, pausing to regain his composure, it can't get any better. In late September, winds come up of over 130 miles an hour. It batters the whole sea pen. Keiko comes through in flying colors. He's celebrating. He's riding those waves. He's enjoying it. Uh, 
you know, ocean conditions are, are his conditions. So I hope I have given you some reassurance. She'll be fine. <laughs> She'll be so fine when she comes back. There is really no reason to worry. Um, at this point, we have only 15 minutes left. OK. OK, well, I was going to give Ken's talk because he couldn't be here, and he, he sends his uh, great regrets. But uh, I'm going to pass on that, and I'll be happy to tell any of you his talk anytime. Now I'd like to turn it over to Susan. OK. Um, OK, well, I will try to keep my brief and Howard said some of what I was going to share, but I, um, rather than try to convince you that it's the right thing or that she'll do well, um, the only thing I, the sequarium's always saying it's, it's, it would be, you know, such a crazy experiment to try to put her in the ocean. And I'm like, no, the experiment was in 1970 when you, you know, put her on a flatbed truck and drove her away out of the ocean. That was the experiment and she lived through that, which is amazing. Um, putting her back is not an experiment. It's making things right. Um, but I just also want to just thank everyone for allowing us to be here and, and share our stories and share Toki Tai's story and to the Lummi Nation for taking on this effort that's been a part of our hearts and lives for two decades. And to the, the Totem Journey crew, um, we were able to catch up with them in LA and go to the Bellingham and Seattle events, and that's just such a powerful, um, it's just such a powerful journey, and seeing how it touches everyone who comes, and each event is so different, but everyone who touches the pole and hears about Tokitai um, and becomes part of the story, you can just see how moved people are. And I, I just I know it's, it's a grueling long trip for them. And um, I just send them our love and strength and, and thankfulness that they're doing that. Um, so we, I joined the effort um, a couple years after Howard and his brother Ken Balcom had, had started the campaign to bring Lolita or Toki Tai home. Um, so I joined a little over two decades ago. Um, and I, I remember the night that I learned about Toki Tai. Um, I was running the Beach Watchers program and we had Wally Funk come showing some of the slides that were in the trailer of the captures. And I hadn't, I had you know, not been on Whidbey Island that long and didn't know about that dark chapter of our history. So first watching that slideshow just um, totally moved me. And Howard had heard about it through a mutual friend and came to the presentation. And at the end stood up and said, you know, one of those whales is still alive and we're working to bring her home. And it was just one of those moments that I knew, I was like, I'm going to help. <laughs> I, that's something I really want to do. And it was um, just when, when we, I met Howard and learned about Toki's story, it was, I just knew it was going to be life changing. And I just had one of those really strong gut feelings that I didn't know why that we met or why this was happening then or what exactly was happening, but I knew um, it was just one of those things that was meant to be and that this was part of my path. Um, but like Howie, I remember feeling really urgent about it and you know, we've got to get her home. She's going to die any day. She's lived longer than any of the other orcas. Um, never 
would I have dreamed then that 20, over 20 years later, we would still be doing this. Um, but I've always, you know, said as long as she holds on, we will keep trying. And when, when I first met her, my first time in Miami, um, I told her that there's a lot of people working to bring her home and that we wouldn't give up. Um, she looked me in the eye and I made her a promise. And I've kept that promise that we will keep on working to bring her home. And we've had many ups and downs and hopes and dreams and disappointments and discouragement. Um, when Dateline did the story about Toki Tai, we thought, this will do it. It's going to get out there nationwide. And, you know, we have a little bit of uplift and then it just kind of falls flat. And um, it, we've just had a lot of ups and downs. And, but we, we think of her every day and she's part of our family. Um, she's been in our life since we met. <laughs> um, and I, I think she can feel somehow that, she, that there are people that want her home and she knows she has a home to come back to and a family to come back to. And I think she can feel the love and the strength from all of us. And I know with the totem journey that that love and strength and healing energy is just growing um, exponentially. The first time I watched her perform, I, I just sat and cried. And everyone around was laughing and cheering and clapping. And I just couldn't believe that people couldn't see what I was seeing. Um, but then I realized this is Miami, where everything is a show in Miami. That's just life. And they didn't have the context of seeing orcas in the wild. And they didn't know where she came from or that she was taken from a family. Um, so we realized right away, you know, after trying to leaflet and talk to people on Miami street corners, um, which was a very thankless task, that in order for them to understand why she needs to come home, they, they needed to understand her family. And so we started doing more education about the Southern resident orcas and their social structure and how connected they are and that. That's why she needed to come back. And then the southern residents started to suffer, and we lost so many of them. They became listed under the Endangered Species Act. And we focused a lot of our efforts to salmon restoration and education and, and trying to convince fish biologists that orcas need Chinook salmon. They are picky. They will die when there's not enough Chinook. They won't just eat something else. Um, it's their culture. It's what they do. It's what they eat. Um, so we continued to fight for Toki's freedom, but we also focused on saving her family and the salmon. Um, then Blackfish happened, and that movie did more than anything we'd done in 15 years to get the public to understand how harmful captivity is to orcas. So that really changed public perception and changed SeaWorld and the Seaquarium. Um, but we were still unable to penetrate the walls of the Seaquarium. Um, we did lawsuits, demonstrations, offers of money to buy her back, um, offers to help transform the Seaquarium into a place where they could have digital whales and learn real education about whales in the wild, um, do live video feeds, things like that, rather than have a sad, um, lonely, captive whale doing tricks for food. Um, but none of that's happened. So after so many years of trying and all of our hopes dashed, um, we got to wherever something positive happened or someone came up and wanted to help us, it's like I couldn't let myself believe that that something positive would happen, and you know, just too many ups and downs. Um, so I was afraid to let myself have hope or believe. Um, and then the Lummies came along and offered their help, and um, we've been friends with Lummies for years through the Pen Cove Water Festival and through events they've done for Orca Network that were whale related. Um, 
and we've always respected their work for the environment um, and the Salish Sea. And it just seemed, it was just a perfect partnership. And it was, um, it just feels so right. And the, the totem pole journey has been so amazing and so full of healing and love. Um, and as I watched so many people touch the pole and just burst into tears and feeling Toki's pain and feeling their own pain, um, and through all that, sending their love and strength and hope to Toki. And as I watched people and heard their stories, um, I realized the journey to bring Toki home and the totem pole journey is a healing journey for Tokitai and for the salmon and the Salish Sea, but also for each of us who are a part of it. Um, for those who witnessed the captures in Pan Cove or took part in them, only later to be haunted by those memories. And some of the captors that we talked to that later changed their ways because they one has said what they suffered in Vietnam was nothing compared to the trauma and the memories of being at the captures and seeing it or taking part in it. Um, it haunted them their whole lives. And the communities on Whidbey Island, Coopville, who has a sad history as, as part of who we are, who we were, to be able to heal that would be very powerful. Um, so when we were at the Totem Journey event in LA, a young girl took her petition around the room and had everybody sign it. And then her mother told us that they had adopted her and she had been abused as a very young child and was normally very shy and wouldn't even talk to people. And she went around to every person in the room and made sure they signed the petition to bring Toki Tai back. And she had a purpose, and she was going to work to bring Toki, Toki back. And in doing that, she was healing herself. Um, and that brought me back to when I first found out about Toki, and at a time when I was struggling to break free of an unhealthy and scary relationship, and trying to find my way out in a new life and get um, get. Um, just be healed and somehow working to bring Toki home made me think about her and what she has suffered through and her strength and resilience and it made me strong um, and I see that happening with so many people along the way over the last 20 years how the work to heal and free Toki Tai has healed and freed us and I think bringing her back to the Salish Sea will right the wrongs of history and it will heal the waters and it will give us the chance to bring back the salmon and to bring up the importance of the need for salmon and clean water for Tokitai and her family and for us and our families and our culture, the whole Northwest that depends on salmon. Um, so when the Lummi became involved, it brought us hope, real hope, for the first time in many decades. And it took a while <laughs> before I let myself believe that this time it will happen. Um, the stars are aligned and the partners that we have needed for so long are here. And um, I'm still holding my breath a little bit, <laughs> but I'm believing. And I feel like this is the time, and this is the meant to be. It just feels so right, and we're so honored and humbled to be a part of it. And we cannot thank the Lummi Nation enough for taking this on and um, helping us bring Toki Tai home. Thank you. <laughs>